All right, what's up, everyone? We are back for another episode of the Pair Program. I'm your host, Tim Winkler, uh, accompanied by my co-host, Mike Gruen. Mike, what's going on? How are you? I'm doing all right. How are you doing? Actually, that's a lie. It's allergy season. I'm hanging in there. Hate, that's really hating life. <laughs> yeah. Well, if not to make your week any worse, I don't know if you heard about the the news of Jerry Springer passed away. Yes, I did um, hear that news. Um, were you a sad. fan? Did you I, did you watch? I watched a little bit. I, fan is too strong a word. I, I, I don't want to blame the messenger, right? Like, I don't think that the decline in society can be directly tied to him. I think he was more taking advantage of a situation, but it definitely should. Like, that was sort of the beginning of the end <laughs> in terms of, like, the death of shame, right? Like, and, and yeah. sort of the, the birth of real reality. Um, Re- it birth of reality TV, dude. really. Yeah. Right. Uh-huh. Um, but he was I, a good I was, dude. Um, so I get a lot I of my news from like a morning brew and mm-hmm. uh, one of the, they gave a shout out to him and like their intro and everything. And, I, and uh, at the end of it, um, I had to give him credit for this is a, such a great line, but it was like for nineties kids, you know, his greatest role was keeping us company on sick days. <laughs> and I was like, that's exactly right. Cause they'd be yeah. like at that 11 o'clock hour and you're like, there's nothing on. Uh, yeah, was, uh, I think pr- price is right. And then price is, yeah, right. <laughs> price is yeah. right. And then switch over to that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then later in the day, it was uh, either job judge Wapner or uh, something else. But anyway, <laughs> okay. Well now you're dating yourself. I don't even um, yeah, you know, I'm just Judy. All right. Just Judy. True. Right. <laughs> um, cool. Well, yeah. RIP. RIP. Uh, Jerry. Uh, Let's give the listeners a little heads up on today's episode. So today we are going to be uh, diving into a topic that, uh, in my opinion, is is one of the most essential departments of a uh, a company or a startup specifically, uh, and that is people operations. Um, Obviously, I'm a a little bit biased on this, just kind of given our focus point for you know at Hatch IT and Hatchpad, um, we are all about people here. Um, But um, we are labeling this episode the evolution of people operations and startups, Uh, and so we're going to be defining the role of people operations in in different stages of of a startup's growth. Uh, We'll we'll dissect a little bit more about some best practices for you know how to scale people ops team as a startup's mature. And then break down, you know, how this kind of department may differ from vertical to vertical. Uh, so we have a couple of, of great guests uh, to help us tackle the topic, both of which have spent years in, in people and operations focused roles. Uh, Jeremy Holloman, uh, who's been a co-founder, VP of People Ops for multiple startups and currently the VP of People for a blockchain startup, Shardium. And Amy Forrester, who's held roles as recruiting manager, uh, VP of people for several startups and, and hyper growth companies, and currently chief people officer for a health and wellness startup firsthand. Uh, thank you both for spending time with us today on the Pair Program. Great to be here. Yeah, my pleasure. Cool. All right. So before we dive in, we we do like to kick things off with a fun segment that we call Pair Me Up. Pair um, Me Up. Where we all go around the room, shout out complimentary pairings. Mike, you always kick us off. What uh, what do you have in store for us? Yeah. So uh, before the show, I was joking with Tim that unfortunately I already used what would have been the pairing for today, which would be the Rangers and Heartbreak and Misery, given that they're losing the series to the Devils. But uh, that was the very first pairing I ever gave. So uh today's pairing is mentors and success um over the course of my career um very early in my career um i got lucky got a mentor who was just phenomenal she helped me throughout a lot of diff- just career development um she was not an engineer uh her background was marketing and then product and then coo ceo um and uh she was someone who i could always call always count on to give me the right advice call me on my bullshit um, stuff like that. So, uh, cool. definitely think that uh, a lot of credit to Dee Dee Haskins for making me who I am today. Fortunately, she passed away a few years ago. Oh man. Well, yeah, mentorship obviously is uh, near and dear to us on the pair program, and it's, anybody that's participating is usually pretty a, a big fan or advocate of mentorship, or has mm-hmm. received a ton of that and wants to give back. Um, so, yeah, clearly important uh for any any sort of career growth um and now mine's gonna sound real elementary uh because it's, <laughs> it's uh my mine is um you know so by the time this releases uh the rangers will have already been booted from the playoffs but uh it'll probably be summertime we'll be nearing summertime at that point so i'm gonna go with 
something that always, you know, brings me back to my childhood during summertime is summertime and Slurpees. Mm. Um, so Slurpees, you know, I don't get them ever uh, throughout the year unless it's like that hot day in like June, July. And, um, you know, every time I go in now, it's a little different than when I was a kid. I was going suicide route, you know, a little, little bit of everything. But now I'm, I'm really dialed into always been like a Coke fan Slurpee, but, you know, mix that with the cherry and get the, the classic cherry Coke Slurpee. So anybody here uh, on that level is, is, is summertime Slurpees hit with you? Does it resonate? <clears throat> that sounds really good right now. Oh. <laughs> it does sound really yeah. good right now. It does sound great. Uh, my mother would never let me have those growing up. So, <laughs> uh, we, I mean, we, where I grew up, we had no Seven Eleven, uh, and then uh, uh, <laughs> I think I can count on, count on one hand how many times I, <laughs> I've had a Slurpee. <laughs> yeah, probably so. Well, yeah. yeah, it's it's raw sugar. I mean, that's really yeah. it. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's it's damn damn good. Um, so I'm sticking to it. Um, all right, let's pass it over to our guest, Amy. Uh, why don't you give us a quick intro and tell us your pairing? Yeah, well, it's great to be here. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, I have been in the people space for, uh, I guess, about 12 or 13 years now. Um, have worked at a handful of different startups, primarily um, in people capacities. And for the past year and several months, have been the chief people officer at First Hand Health. Uh, so we work with individuals who receive uh, Medicaid and in certain states and work with them to gain access to benefits and care that they're eligible for. Um, my pairing, also food related, um, I'm thinking a lot about that right now as I'm seven months pregnant and thinking about what I am enjoying and not enjoying. Um, popcorn and chocolate chips uh, mm. are two of my favorite things. You've got to pour the chocolate chips in when the popcorn comes out of the microwave, mix it up. And the ratio is super important. So, you know, making sure that there's not too many chips to popcorn, uh, but that's one of my favorite, favorite snacks. So what's the ratio? Uh, you know, you got to eyeball it, but I would say it's just like a, a nice sprinkling of chocolate chips mm. into your popcorn bag All and right. then a, a good shake and some salt. Nice. That's solid. That sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... One congrats on the <laughs> soon, soon to be, um, Thank but, you. uh, uh, we just went to a, uh, kind of like a farmer's market last weekend and they had kettle corn going and oh. I swear, I mean, I, I so don't bad. really always bite on it, but we got the big bag and it's just been, it was gone within 48 <laughs> hours. And I mean, and it's, it's just so good. Cause it's got a little sweetness to it and then you'll get a salty bite. I think that's, what's great about so you good. Know, your yeah. pairing. Little sweetness, little little salty. Um, awesome. Well, awesome. Really great work that you guys are doing at first hand too. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll pass it over to our second guest. So, Jeremy, a quick intro in your pairing. Yeah. Um, so, Jeremy Holloman. Um, I came into the world of people ops via the first two companies I co-founded, and sort of felt like I had a. It felt natural for me to own that area of the business, and I was really drawn to it. Um, so after. My own, my own two companies for the last most of the last decade. Um, and this past August, I joined a Web three, very distributed blockchain company, which has been very fascinating and interesting. In from the people ops perspective, um, and we can talk about that more later. But um, Tim, just so you're not alone on the sports one, I, I'll, I'll do a quick sports pairing. Sweet. Um, for me, it's going to be the Boston Celtics and an 18th championship this year. Um, hopefully. Ooh. That's I'm not. <laughs> hopefully, when this uh, goes live, it's, that, that is true. Um, but in, <laughs> you called your shot. I like that. <laughs> and um, actually, so, but my real one um, is I would say actually in New York when I was biking like an hour a day, a day into like Manhattan and back. Um, it was always cycling and like audiobooks and podcasts. Mm. Uh, it was kind of like my daily like meditation almost um, nowadays since i'm in suburbia and drive everywhere um it is my uh, rock climbing gym and podcasts or audiobooks cool nice what's the uh rock climbing gym that you go to it's called flowstone um it's actually normally i, I they have a little co-working space there too so i'm like i work there and then i oh, climb a little bit throughout the day randomly in between That's meetings cool. 
um yeah it's a really nice setup um so been going there for is it is it uh because i i was just talking to somebody about going to you know just meeting new people go to a rock going to a rock climbing gym and uh one of their biggest qualms though was like you never get a chance to get on the wall because it's so so crowded do you find that it's like you know is it just got to go at a certain time or is it does it get pretty popular like pretty crowded over there I'm there with like the work from home crowd during the middle of the day so it's like it's not crowded really at all right. yeah um, so i think I'm, I'm lucky in that sense so it's um and it's it's pretty large uh, like bouldering gym so it's uh it's, it has been an issue unless i go in the afternoon or evening so. that's cool yeah nice yeah i i don't do much rock climbing but um i've been been once or once in new zealand and it oh, was cool. an incredible thrill but um kudos to people that can do that stuff like on a regular basis it is a uh, it's it's a it's a whole nother extreme type of sport yeah, I'm, I'm a total novice but there, you see these people in there just doing like these pull-ups with like on these like five millimeter holds like this and you're just Unreal. Like, <laughs> yeah it's, it's incredible it's insane um awesome all right well we've got a good crew here um we've got a uh, a number of uh, little subtopics to to tap into so let's let's jump into it um so as I mentioned, we are going to be talking about people operations, you know, kind of breaking down everything about this department, how it evolves and much more. And um, I, I always think it's fascinating of, of this specific area of people ops because it still feels very new uh, in a lot of ways. And I think something that we'll touch on is how, you know, the emphasis on people has uh, evolved since like the early 2000s. And in startup world uh, and how like in the last five years or so, it's really, really um, taken off and, and become a, a hot topic and a top priority, I think is really interesting. But um, I, I'd love for context, um, you know, just to kind of set the stage that there are different areas that, that are going to be b- uh, batched into people operations. So for example, like talent and recruiting, human resources, um, these can sometimes be grouped in depending on the size of the company or the org build out and so forth. But let's go to our guest and let's see, you know, how they kind of define people ops. Um, Amy, let's start with you. Uh, if you want to maybe talk through some of your past experiences in your career uh, in the field and, and you know, what some of those areas of focus that kind of fall within people ops. Uh, and, you know, as you're referencing those, like what was the size of the company during those different kind of definitions of the role? Yeah, it's been interesting. You know, I've worked in, you know, like I said, mostly startups. They have had a number of different types of, um, you know, different sizes and stages. Uh, The, you know, the largest company I worked in was probably Living Social. It was at its height about 5,000 people. And we had everything in people ops. Like it felt like, you know, we had such a huge supportive group, probably like at one point 40 people in recruiting, um, you know, 10 HR business partners, uh, HR operations, managing like vendors and things like that. Um, and then, you know, employee, uh, excuse me, employee communications. We had a whole group that was really dedicated to that. So thinking about our internal employment brand and how we manage that. So all in that people team at one point was probably close to 100 people um, and lots of different sub functions within it. When I started at first hand a little bit over a year ago, I was employee number, I think, 15. Um, and so I was doing all of those different functions or whatever was sort of needed and probably other things too. So I think that it can really run the gamut um, and other you know, organizations will have lots of different makeups um, included in the function, but it can really be you know, so many different things. I think you know, sort of the evolution from my perspective that's been interesting in the past, like even like six or seven years, more than probably I saw before, is that it's really now about putting the employee at the center as the customer of, you know, your business. Um, and so how are you thinking about the different programs, the different services, the different needs that they have? And those can come to life in a lot of different ways. So it might be in a benefit offering that you have. Mm-hmm. It might be in your, um, you know, approach to 
uh, remote work. It could be mm-hmm. anything really um, where you're just kind of thinking about what are the ways in which we can attract great talent, keep great talent, and really not just keep them, but like keep them really happy and productive. Um, so that kind of, I think, has morphed, and I'm curious how Jeremy thinks about this too. Um, it sort of morphed the way that you approach a lot of those different traditional sub-functions within people operations. Yeah. Yeah, it's really fascinating. And also, I think COVID really made people have to think outside the box. Um, you know, you put a pandemic in, in the way and and what we saw was a lot of like um, individualized, personalized benefits, right? Where one size doesn't really fit all anymore. Let's try to cater to folks on a one-to-one basis, which maybe is a little bit easier for startups than it is like a much larger organization. But um, uh, either way, like that paired with um, the war for talent being really tight during a few years, a little bit different now, right? So, uh, you know, we can talk about that too, of like how that, how, is that going to change? Um, you know, maybe uh, now that we're in a, a world of a lot of layoffs and rifts, um, but um, on the topic, let's let's kick it to Jeremy first uh, to continue to kind of see like your point of view on on how people operations has evolved and, and what have you seen during those different stages of the companies you've worked with? Yeah. And just to comment on your last point, like it's, I think it will be very interesting to see how things evolve or maybe in, in some people's eyes devolve a little bit like, yeah. um, as we have gone from like what is, I would say, primarily my career has been in this zero interest rate policy environment uh, and yeah, how, how that's going to change the whole benefit structure. Or, mm-hmm. uh, but yeah, so similarly, mostly have been in pretty early stage startups through like series B and, you know, definitely those early stages it's pretty much just it was just me uh mm-hmm. maybe 75 percent talent acquisition 25 percent uh people operations and i really kind of through series maybe a I always kind of consider those are just like my main two pillars and building out starting to really build out a recruiting machine and then on the flips on the other side of the house really just focusing on like retention and um starting to really build out like the employee experience um, and hopefully being able to automate, you know, the core HR functions through, you know, great tools that didn't really exist when I started my first company, Urban Stems, like JustWorks or Deal or Rippling, all these things that are like have made things mm-hmm. so much easier. Um, so, you know, spent a lot, a lot of time building out really in those focus of those two pillars and then underneath those going into like building out technical recruiting, um, which I'm doing right now. Um, and maybe we'll work with you guys <laughs> once <laughs> once we out, outpace uh, Will, who joined my team recently, and then um, and obviously the general recruiting side as well um, as as the need in the hiring roadmap increases. But as we got to our Series B at my last startup, then we definitely I brought in like I guess kind of like an HR business partner where I had them really focusing on building out our initial like career path thing, performance management. Um, and really getting a lot smarter around how we were doing compensation, especially as we went from 15 people in New York to 125 people Mm. all over the U S from varying different geos, um, and some outside the U S. So, um, that's something I'm trying to really figure out how to do on a global scale now, as we are post, you know, heading towards our series A, but we're across like 15 different countries right now in my current Mm -hmm. startup. So. So on that note, so uh, I guess like Urban Stems um, was that the one you you uh, or was was that you said got to a, about a hundred, uh, one hundred twenty five? Uh, Urban Stems and Clyde both. Uh, and Clyde. Urban Stems probably close to like two hundred people or so now. But so I left day to day there in like two thousand eighteen to start Clyde, um, which at its peak was like one twenty five, and was recently acquired by uh, Cover Genius, a larger insure tech. But um, it was probably around fifty people at that point. So I think what's interesting is like, so you were kind of standing up internally, you know, this kind of recruiting infrastructure, um, uh, talent acquisition and people ops. Um, But then you mentioned you looped in an HR business partner. Did you hire an HR business business person internally or did you use like an HR consultant to kind of come in? Oh, yeah. So I hired like a generalist, like HR person. Um, Internally. Yeah, internally to to join me uh, to help to build out a lot of these different programs. Got it. Okay, cool. Yeah, I bring it up because in similar in talent too, you know, 
I think when you're between the size of, you know, uh, you know, 10 and, and 50 sometimes, right. Uh, these are two functions that I've seen, you know, engage fractional consultants or, mm-hmm. um, uh, just consulting partners until they get to a certain headcount. We're like, we really need to be mindful about our internal culture and, um, you know, building out more of a, like a, a standard process. But uh, on the flip side, I feel like that's changing uh, and we've seen it, seen it change a little bit more. And I think, Amy, you're kind of a testament to this, too, of um, at first hand, you know, uh, you said you're 15th and, um, higher. Yeah, thereabouts. Yeah. And and I and I, you know, it's, it's part of a talking point, but, you know, I wonder how that varies from vertical to vertical, um, you know, on on where they place that value of having that person in house, you know, early, early on, um, because maybe it resonates with their company's values or something like along those lines versus outsourcing that type of stuff until, you know, people's like 50s to 75 and headcount or something like that. That's been one of the, I mean, one of the reasons why I joined firsthand really is because, you know, the, our company got started in October of 2021. And I think, you know, it was probably the week or so in which uh, it was really launched. Our co-founder said, you know, we want to start a search for a chief people officer because we care so much about the culture and we care so much about making sure that this is right from the very beginning or or intentional and very thoughtful from the very beginning. Um, And that was super compelling for me because, you know, to have the opportunity to build really from the very, very beginning and to, you know, set norms, to set rituals, to do all these things that, you know, we can be proactive and we can be creative and we don't have to do things um, just because this is how it's been sort of like by default happening at a company. Like we can really shape this to be what we want it to be. And so that for me has been super, super cool in this experience Mm -hmm. to come in really early uh, and have the opportunity to lay some of that foundation. Mm -hmm. With with uh, with Shardium, Jeremy, um, you know, we t- touched on this a little bit in our uh, disco call, but you know, for for maybe fintech uh, or or even in in like uh, blockchain Web three space, um, it, it might not be as much of a priority for a lot of these organizations to prior like to to put in place like oh we really want to focus on people internally and and culture is essential and. Um, and I'm, yeah, you know, I'm making a, a generalist kind of statement, but I'd love to hear your input because you you mentioned like it's one of the reasons that you were really intrigued was like they they wanted to place an emphasis on people and, and operations and culture uh, with bringing you in at an earlier stage than maybe you would traditionally see. So, what is your thoughts on like vertical to vertical? Yeah, I mean, I would say it's it was very similar to like I, I think Amy's sentiments there. Um, you know when I was starting to explore what I was going to do next after my last startup, um, I was either going to go back and start another company, but I also had just had our second kid and it was probably going to be a terrible time to try to do that. Uh, but another topic that we will bring up, uh, later on, uh, another episode <laughs> to bring, to bring you back for, uh, but ultimately I like, I'd been following the space for so long and I was really curious and I knew that like, it was almost analogous to like, 15 years ago in tech where I don't think like, yeah, the first 50 hires, like, you probably couldn't find an age, like people ops person within mm-hmm. like any YC company back then. Um, and I saw that really change over the, like, you know, my first decade within startups and tech. And um, so when I started to look at different like web three organizations and I really wanted to be, so I'm at a layer one blockchain startup. So I, I wanted to be on like sort of a infrastructure layer of, of the ecosystem. And, uh, but as I started to like look around, I noticed that there just wasn't any people ops across, <laughs> you know, globally across any, most of these um, like foundations or, or what we call, what we're called our projects. And, um, and it was kind of like serendipitous that as I was kind of coming to that um, sort of, as, as I found that, you know, I was recruited by this headhunter um, that was working with Nishal Shetty, who's our CEO um and co-founder and um was just super intrigued that there was somebody in web3 that was really bringing in as their first actually second executive after the founders uh, mm-hmm. head of people um and you know first like first 20 employee as well um so that immediately uh, i made 
that almost sold me on the spot that they were actually thinking about that in a in a really in a ecosystem that hadn't put that at the forefront. So mm-hmm. um, I. I, I see a little bit of a tide shift uh, within the space. So hopefully we continue to see it go in that direction because I think it's mm-hmm. obviously positive. And it's a difficult cultural machine or whatever to build because we're, like I said, we're, we're across so many different nations and um, cultures and, and um, yeah, it's, it's, it, there's, there's a lot more complexity to it. So we have to be thoughtful from the outset. So, yeah. Yeah. As far as like, you know, the evolution of people to ops departments from different stages. So we like to get a little bit granular when we talk about startups. So like at seed stage to A to B, what would you say um, become top priority for the department uh, to kind of keep keep in mind or to, to focus on as you go from, you know, say, say seed to A or, or you know, A to B? Um, what, what are the things that, you know, you all have seen as like, we, we need to really be aware of this because this is happening. Um, Amy, Jeremy, either of you. Yeah. I mean, for me, I think like at the very beginning, and I think that this is actually a through line, no matter what stage you're in, but it's just about, you know, for, you're going to be growing, it's setting your recruiting practice up to be successful. Um, and thinking about, you know, who are the types of people that we want at this company? You know, what are the ways in which we go about, you know, meeting them and selecting them? Um, and then, you know, there's the other side of it, which is how you help them, uh, you know, set up how you set them to be successful at the organization um, and help your managers, um, you know, successfully, you know, coach their team members. But I think that the recruiting piece really early is always super important, how you think about that and how you make sure that like, if you have um, a great hire, you can help them thrive. If you have a hire that was a miss, like you're figuring out how you deal with that Mm -hmm. so that it doesn't become, you know, this cultural issue. Mm but I, I think as you get like later stage, like a lot of this stuff for people also becomes like, how do we have systems and process that scale? Um, that was something we uh, not too long ago uh, raised our series B. And as a part of that, like uh, one of the things that I did was really look out to see, okay, like what's working, what's scaling, like we're on a PEO. We are now at like 75 employees. This was last year. Like we're going to be at 150 early 2023. Like we probably need to be on a different payroll and benefit system. So a lot of it is like, okay, what's actually going to work for the size and scale of the organization that we are becoming here in the near term? And that's where like as you get later stage, like you want to make sure a lot of that stuff is set up to scale successfully. Yeah, I mean, I can I can agree more. Um, and yeah, at the risk of not like I don't, I don't want to repeat <laughs> just repeat anything, but like 100 percent like building a great recruiting muscle into the organization, um, hire really well. That's that's really always been the core focus up through our Series A. Um, especially a lot of times you're dealing with pretty green hiring managers, um, and there's just so much coaching and mentoring mm-hmm. along that, um, and it's tough. You know, they they have so much to do and. You know, nobody wants to spend 50% of their time also hiring and going through recruiting process and figuring that out. So, um, but that's where I think customer first, treating them like the customer and really guiding mm-hmm. them through that process is like, I, that's where I focus at the beginning um, and ditto on the rest. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's one a, thing I was, I was going to yeah. say, like, I think you guys are talking about like your experiences within coming in or whatever, I can talk a little bit about the experience of like what happens when you defer that for too long, because that's a pretty common, like I've worked at any number of companies where I think that we should be hiring somebody like you within the first 15 to 20 people we're going to, or certainly right before big growth. And so that you, so we have that partner to help us through all that stuff. Um, Having been at companies that like defer that and bring it in, bring that person in much later, it's a nightmare. Um, Mm -hmm. and I think it's, there is a lot of, I think what Amy was talking about of like, well, this is the way we've done it. So we're just going to keep doing it that way. And it's, it's really hard to change things and especially like recruiting or like, why is the interview process 17 steps? This seems insane. Well, this is the way we've always done it. We can't change it now. And it's like, oh, so, uh, I definitely, uh, advocate for bringing, uh, people, people in way early on. It's one of the things, um, a, a number of startups I've been sort of 
at the forefront of like pushing with the executives. And, and one of the things I'd also say, I'm curious for, you know, uh, Jeremy and Amy to weigh in, but like, what are some of the things that if I'm a founder, what should I be looking for in a people person? Because one of the ones is to me, putting the people first, there's a lot of HR people in the world who say that they put the people first, but they don't necessarily put the people first. And they get along really well with some founders. And I think sometimes what you want is a little bit of a, a different voice. You want the voice of the the employee um, and you don't just want another sort of voice for the the, the bottom line. I'm curious what your thoughts are. Um, maybe uh, start with Amy. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. I mean, I think, you know, on the one hand, having like a strong alignment with your CEO does make this job you're you're better enabled to get your work done if you have that. Definitely. Um, but yeah, I think like you know, being not afraid to sort of dissent and um, you know push back if they or any other person at the company is sort of like doing something that's out of line with the values. I think it, like honestly, it does come down to like what are our values here? Or, like, mm -hmm. am I aligned to that as the head of people? Um, and is that somebody who like you know even when I think like you probably want a head of people who even when, uh, you know, decisions are really hard, there might be like something that is a not great outcome that occurs. Like, are they going to try to stay true to the company's values and, um, you know, work through it in that way? Or are they just going to pivot and be like, sorry, like this, these are hard times and like, we're going to do something different. Like, I think you probably want somebody who is going to be that, like beacon for your values of the organization um, and help drive those through. Yeah, definitely. Like sort of almost the conscious of the conscience of the, of the organization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think obviously my last two, I was also the co-founder, but uh, maybe that made it, a, you know, I knew my CEO and co-founder extremely well. Um, and, but I also understood my role as being the voice of the employee base. And, uh, but because I knew him so well, I could, you know, actually, we could call each other out on our shit. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. uh, and but it was really important that there was somebody there that could actually, you know, do that um, and and speak to him in a, a very transparent way and make sure that we were always being like true to like the mission or our values that we had you know spoken through. Yeah, I think one of the things that we see, which I think is kind of universal across startups, right? It's like you're trying in early stages, let's just call it seed and A, you're trying to get as much juice from the squeeze as you can, right? And so when we talk about like uh, a multifaceted head of people and, you know, we kind of allude to like talent, recruiting, um, you know, kind of culture, you know, making sure folks feel um, like they're a part of, of the organization, which becomes challenging in a distributed workforce. Um, you know, how do you prioritize? Cause every, you know, we, we've kind of said like talent and recruiting and I'm, I can speak to this from a, as a third party recruiting partner, right. You know, we, we see one of two things where it's either we're going to build out an internal recruiting department, which is different than like saying, we're going to build out like an HR team um, versus, you know, we're going to focus on building a really awesome culture and we're going to outsource some of the, some of the, like the, sourcing piece of, of, you know, driving actual talent to us. Um, how do we prior, where, where do you all kind of see like you, you, you draw the line or you prioritize, we want to bring, we want to keep talent in house versus, uh, it's okay at this stage to kind of like keep it just one people person and let's work with a partner that we trust, um, or an agency or two, you know, I, that, that is something that I've always seen is like, it really goes one of two ways. And so I'm always curious on internally, like those conversations with founders of why do they want to go, let's build the talent team in house for these reasons. Like, what do you lose? I guess when you start to look at a partner, because I, I can tell you what we see. It's like, we want to like, you know, and, and I think this is a, a big problem with staffing, which is something that we've been trying to solve for, for years is you have this disconnect of, are you really going to find folks that resonate with our culture and our values? Or are you just going to find me a person that matches the skill set that we're looking for? Like, how do we know that you're going to still look for folks that as if you were an internal person with us, um, you lose that with a lot of vendors. I, I, I know for a fact, and we try to, we try to solve that problem. So 
how like if you're not privy to that or you don't know of those part those partners that are out there like what is it that you're trying to um convey to your founder of you know this is why we're going to build it internal or this is why we're not That's you know one. yeah it is it's hard <laughs> like every nice easy softball is- yeah, <laughs> like because I feel like this this comes back to vertical too. Like Amy, I feel like at first hand, like it's like listen, you know, we're in in kind of like a health healthcare environment, uh, health and wellness, and it's important for us to have all of this in house. You know, just we don't want to lose, it. we don't want to set up a risk to to have one bad apple come through just because we wanted to not invest in this internal t- yeah. talent department. I, well, maybe you want to go or go, go ahead, Jeremy. Uh, I was going to kind of relate it to my experience with uh, Clyde, the last company. So uh, we were, it was my first B2B SaaS company. So first time me and my co-founder ever building out like a sales org um, and everything that comes along with that. <laughs> um, and looking back on like the five years of building that, um, I would say we brought in a VP of sales like too early. Uh, we should have been founder led sales much longer. Um, and I think that's very similar t- for all the reasons why it should be founder led sales for like close product feedback loops. Cause generally they're going to be the head of product really at, at that stage as well. Mm. Um, for all those reasons, I think it's super important that talent is at the early stages. They should be the front line selling the vision to all these candidates and, and really setting that like culture from like first employee meet um, to, you know, hire through onboarding, um, at least through in post series A, I've always had like, I would say a mix of like outsourced recruiting partners of varying different sort of capabilities. But I would say like pre series A is just so important that, 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 that is really being ingrained within the founding mm-hmm. team. So similar to sales. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I mean, I think, it is really important, you know, as you're making those early hires that you are able, I love that the closed feedback loop, I think that's exactly right. Like you are in really close touch with recruiting, the hiring manager, you know, other colleagues or whoever. Um, but I do think, you know, like I find a lot of value in external partners, you know, at different stages and for different reasons. Like, you know, right now we have uh, an internal team that's primarily focused on our community teams. Um, but on the tech side, you know, we're, we can partner with others. And so I think that that's where, you know, when we have awesome um, partners there, like that really drives and fuels our growth too. So it's a bit of a balance. Um, and there's not like one right formula for it. A lot of it, I think just sort of depends on, you know, what your priorities are at the company at the time. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's interesting to hear your exec hires is like something like where, like as much as I I fancy myself a pretty good executive recruiter personally, like, um, those are people that are just the really top tier talent is just so hard to get in front of or get your brand. No, mm-hmm. Nobody knows about. <laughs> so yeah. it's, it's, that's where I also have likely gotten, gotten a lot of support externally in the past. Yeah. Yeah. All I was going to say was, I think it's interesting hearing your answer to Tim's question. Cause like, if you think about the, all of us on this call, right? Like Tim on the recruiting side, me more of the hiring manager side. And then you obviously in the middle. Um, all of the same reasons you give about like why you like may or may not want to work with an agency is all the same reasons I give because I'm I consider myself a very strong hiring manager. I like interviewing. I like that process. And so all of the same reasons I'm like, no, I don't want to work. I want to do this. I want to write the job description. Yeah. I want to yeah. control the interview. I want to be the first person they talk to. And so it's kind of interesting to hear, you know, that that perspective. And if I can find the right partner and people, it's great. That that's when things go really, really smoothly, right? When we can agree, like this is how the interview process should go, and this is where it makes sense for you to participate or for me to participate, and so forth. But I thought it was interesting to hear the the answers. It's it's um it's also it's like. You, there needs to be a level of trust. And I think everybody's got a good story about being burnt by an agency um, <laughs> to where it's like, all right, you've, I've been burnt too many times. Like, uh, how do I trust you? And I think okay. like in those early stages too, um, like I personally too, like I, I wouldn't trust a vendor to hire our internal team when we're uh, you know under 20. Um, and there's, there's a level of that you kind of alluded to Jeremy, that is also a, a topic that we've covered on, in previous episodes called letting go. And I think, you know, there's a tough 
task of letting go of, of having that um, connection with the people uh, that you're bringing in and you feel like, you know, you, you kind of a little bit more in control of the process um, to let go of that in those earlier stages is really challenging. Um, and that letting go translates over to a CTO letting go of, you know, uh, getting heads down in code and, and so forth. Right. So it really does kind of translate across um, startups universally. Um, but, you know, I, I did want to also cover because it's top of mind right now. And I think, you know, there's there's a huge uh, responsibility for people that are in people operations, um, HR, um, to kind of be a, a face to some of what we're seeing right now, especially in big tech and commercial startup land is layoffs um, is, is, I mean, you can't open up a, a news feed without seeing some sort of a, a massacre of a layoff. And it's, um, it's affecting people internally. If, if you, you, you think of it or not, it, it is, they're seeing it, you know, everybody, there's a lot of fear um, out there. So I just wanted to kind of bring it out um, and talk about it of, you know, how are you all, how do you all handle that with, within your team? Um, you know, if, if it's happening or not happening, how do you kind of either put folks at ease or if it is happening, how do you do it and how do you do it strategically? Um, yeah, I've, uh, I've struggled through like the COVID mass zoom, impersonalized layoff stuff. It's like, I get the practicality piece of it, but you know, in, I've had to lead three large, per, not that, you know, thousands of employees, but like large percentage for our company size um, reduction in forces. And, you know, it's always been super important that that person had both their, like their manager and someone from HR on that call with them or in person with them to talk them through it. And I, I couldn't really ever see myself doing it any different way. Um, and then I personally t take project manage or lead outplacement efforts and just do whatever I, I spent the, the probably the months after that um, both both of the last few ones just really focus on how can I make intros um, using my network and the company's network and our investor networks to get people lined up for jobs because uh, showing that you're willing to put in that work after the fact is helps make everybody that's still there know that you're, you're going to do the right thing in all these situations so yeah, um, yeah that, that just quick thought on it. So sure. Yeah. Amy, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. I agree. I, I think the, I was involved in a couple sort of like of the COVID era zoom uh, layoffs. And fortunately, you know, today I think like we're in a place where that's, you know, not something that's really on our radar as an organization, which is great. It's a great place to be, but um, you feel a lot of empathy for those who are going through that in the world. Um, but similarly, you know, I feel like a lot of the the way in which some of these have been handled obviously leaves a lot to be desired. And I would have a hard, hard time um, seeing myself or our organization ever conducting uh, any sort of action like that in that way where it's like impersonal. I think like, you know, really just making sure that people um, feel heard, that they feel ha that they have the answers that they need, whether they're leaving the company or they're staying with the company through an event like that, I think is huge. And I think, you know, to Jeremy's point, like it doesn't end on the day that um, mm -hmm. the reduction happens. Like a lot of work happens beyond that to really try to help the people who are no longer with the organization um, get a great place to, to land. So um, yeah, I think just like, you know, more empathy and more care in those would be great. I know that uh, big companies are probably doing the best that they can, but um, some of the ways in which they've handled it have seemed really disappointing. Yeah. Yeah. Especially like, you know, like I think everyone that grew up in like tech and people ops over the last like 15 years, like read like Google's Laszlo box book. Um, and like, yeah. then seeing how Google handled it, I was just like, Oh, that's such a bummer. He's like <laughs> people have been there for 20 years getting an email layoff. <laughs> like, that's yeah, awful. it really is. I mean, you know, I, I kind of think of it of, of you know, uh, if you're quitting a job, right? Like everybody's always said, like, look, leave on good terms, right? You're, you're going to need that person to kind of vouch for you. Even if you've already got something else lined up, it's great. But you never want to leave on bad terms. And it really goes for the other party as well. If you're doing a layoff, the word's going to get out. And 
it's going to ruin, it's going to really hurt your reputation and it's going to impact you for when you will hire again. And to think like you've wiped your hands clean of it. Oh, we got rid of the folks. All right, we're good. You know, it's, it's, um, and it, you know, I, I it's, it's easier said than done, of course. Uh, but, uh, handling it as if, you know, you would, if you were, you know, leaving a, a, a role, like, you know, give, give notice and you get some, you do it in person or, or at least over a zoom or something along those lines. Like there's, there's some, some protocol that I think, um, could, could certainly be more, uh, a requirement for, for how it's done. But yeah. And I think the other thing yeah. that Jeremy touched on, it's not just about your reputation for when you go to hire again, it's for all the people that are still there and how they, mm. they see how you treat people you're letting go. And that speaks volumes and they, they don't want, you know, the best people will see that and be like, you know what? I don't want that to be how I, my departure goes. I want to be in control of it. And so you run the risk of also having additional churn and it's going to be some of your best employees who, who are going to leave in those situations. Um, so it's, it's, it's very short sighted to be like, Oh, we just washed our hands of it. And um, so, yeah, uh, I think a lot back to like the dot com era, like that, those mass layoffs and how those situations went down. And I think one thing I think back to one of the companies I've worked at that struggled a lot was there were a number of people we wanted to reward, um, even though we were letting other people go. And I'm curious what your thoughts are, especially now that, you know, same things, like how do you handle promotions and raises? I remember um, like really concrete concretely somebody coming to me and be like hey if we could keep this person on i don't i don't need a raise if that means that blah 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 could stay for like and it's like yeah we could keep them for a couple of weeks like if you're, you're, we're not giving you that big of a raise that it's going to make that much of a difference to how long we can keep this person um or we also had a free lunch benefit and people are like why don't we get rid of, rid of the free lunch benefit it's like well because that costs us a couple thousand dollars it's not so i'm curious like on those benefits and and promotions and salaries like do you have any advice um, on how to sort of handle that while you're also going through layoffs and how that communication um, can happen in a positive way and, and stuff like that? Um, either one of you, when you feel <laughs> up to answering. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Was, oh yeah, you can go. I, I was just going to say, I think like, you know, just being like really transparent with your employees who are remaining about what the priorities for the company are. And then like, if you're going to be, I think it's fine to like have promotions to reward people who are there, but like, you know, talk about why you're doing what you're doing, you know, not like at a macro level, right? Like, you know, and just making sure that people have that general understanding. Um, I think it's like when, you know, it feels like a bunch of people left and then like things don't seem like they're clear or transparent. That's where companies really kind of get into trouble. So I think just being clear about what our objectives are, clear about why we're doing this and not that um, is huge. And like, just don't like try to hide stuff, like just be honest about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, the other side of, you know, strategizing and like building the plan for a riff is like, what are you doing on the, what's your retention strategy and like, what are you offering people? Mm -hmm. um, especially when like maybe offering them equity is right after layoffs doesn't feel so great. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you have to, you have to a lot of other things. And there's, um, but like, I think it's, well, yeah, it does feel, probably weird for some people to like see someone getting the pro promotion. There are generally those times of those consolidations of responsibilities and like work. And like, you have mm -hmm. to recognize the extra effort people are going to be taking there. So I think most people see that they might not, maybe not on day one, but um, you got to reward the people that are going to be like really carrying you through that next admittedly more difficult stage. Yeah. It's, it's so true. And it's like, you know, the reality is like, you're going to now ask those folks to do more with less. So what are you, what are you going to do for them too now? You know, right. so it is, it is an interesting, it's an interesting time. Um, but, uh, hopefully it's, uh, it, you know, it will, um, be a little bit more of a positive outlook uh, a little bit later on this year. Um, but why don't we, yeah, why don't we pivot uh, to our our next segment? <laughs> we, we'll, we'll pivot to a cheery uh, segment here uh, called the five second scramble. Um, and so this is a fun this is a fun one where I'm going to ask each of you a series of questions. Kind of give me your 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 best answer, your response within. Try to keep within five seconds. Uh, we're not going to give you the air horn if you go over or anything like that. <laughs> but uh, we'll, it'll be a little bit of business, a little bit of personal. Um, I'm going to uh, start with you, Jeremy. Um, you, are you ready for it? 
as ready as I'll ever be, I think. Okay. <laughs> let's let's do it. So what uh what problems are you solving at Shardium? All right, so th- I think this is going to be a pretty I'll, I'll point out something pretty interesting and I would say maybe unique to like a web3 um, organization. Um we are an extremely like entity light structure as an organization. We have a Swiss foundation, a Dubai entity where our CEO and founders, we don't have a US entity. So we're like this global, like open source project with a bunch of freelancers, essentially. <laughs> and like, how do you build a really great culture on that where everyone still feels, feels extremely connected, especially since our goal is in three to four years become a DAO or, you know, for the uninitiated, a decentralized autonomous organization. Mm-hmm. And that actual, you know, central governing entity that is our foundation will actually be dissolved. And it'll just be a community token holder governed um, project. So like building um, culture, people ops, um, like advancements for the internal team, all that stuff around that type of framework is a really complex and sophisticated like issue, which I'm probably be solving until we become a DAO. So <laughs> cool. Yeah. All right. All right. Um, what is your, what's your favorite aspect of working at Shardium? Um, so, you know, I think it's obviously been an extremely difficult year for like web three. Um, that goes without saying, right. I think I was joining the team. I joined the team like two weeks before FTX happened and I was re- interviewing with them during like the Terra Luna and Three Arrows Capital collapse, and so it's it, it's been a you know a bumpy road generally for the ecosystem. But I feel like we, the entire industry, kind of has like this user experience um, issue in the sense that all these none of these layer ones or are supporting the ability to build like mass adopted solutions that, you know, because of like throughput issues or volume or transaction amount um, issues. Like I think Ethereum does like 13 transactions per second, you know, MasterCard or Visa on their (laughs) web one technology does like hundreds of thousands a second. So Mm -hmm. that's like what we need to compete with to be able to build real world solutions. And I feel like our technology will be the first layer one blockchain that can enable that type of user experience and help people within this space build real solutions for real people. And um, so I think there's a lot of potential upside there and there's definitely a lot to prove out, but I think that's being part of something that could really change the narrative for Web3 um, is exciting for me. Cool. These are going to be drastically different answers that Amy gives. I can, <laughs> I can see it. Um, what uh, what type of technologist thrive, would, would thrive at Shardium? Um. So I think people that have been a um, part of like open source projects uh, before uh, really like sort of self-directed enge- engineers really like I would say like that that is the type of people that we're really looking for um, given the nature of our tech. Um, obviously, we're very deep tech in the sense that we're like base base layer base layer infrastructure layer like distributed system um, at its core. So I you know people with those backgrounds as well. Yeah. What professional advice would you give your younger self just starting your career? Oh man, uh especially in startups, uh the lows aren't as bad as you think. <laughs> <laughs> That's solid. That's sound advice, man. Um what do you love most about yourself? Um I think I'm. I have a sort of a native ability to, um, and we can get all psychological on this because it's probably because I was bullied a lot when I was a kid. But <laughs> I think I have, I have, <laughs> I have a really good way of making people like get helping people bring out their best and making people feel extremely welcome and comfortable and, and putting them in an environment where they're able to be super successful. And I think that's been like my startup superpower awesome i feel like that needs to be like a number one bullet point for a people operations person too right it's a that's a great it's a great trait uh favorite type of bagel uh, man oh so uh, just by itself it probably like every a lot of people in everything bagel um i have a very weird favorite bagel for like a sausage egg and cheese it's mm. the cinnamon raisin whoa I love sweet, savory sort of combinations. Um, so that that's 
that's my difference. Nice. Power, <laughs> power answer right there. Um, my wife hates it. She thinks it's the weirdest thing. Ever. <laughs> that could have been a really solid <laughs> pairing, by the way. <laughs> it's like, are you a, are you a McGriddle person or no? You know, like uh... <laughs> if I went to McDonald's more, I would be. But every time I go to McDonald's, I get a Big Mac. So <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a classic. Um, what is the worst fashion trend that you ever followed? Uh, so I, I think I grew up, you know in like the Jenko jeans, like elementary school, middle school era. And um, yeah, I never found that to be a particularly great era in American fashion. And every single day I drive down our street past our local high school and it's all coming back. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so worried about that. <laughs> um, like bucket hats, everything. It's all like the mid nineties yeah. are back to the clothing perspective in our, our local high schools. So um Someone needs to try to reverse that. <laughs> and it's Billie, apparently it has to do with Billie Eilish, but <laughs> yeah. Well, Janko jeans was mine as well. That's uh, that's checking the box for sure. Um, nice. to dig what, up is a, <laughs> <laughs> what is a, a charity or a corporate philanthropy that's near and dear to you? Um, my regular sort of monthly uh, donation I do is the ACLU. Uh, I think they do great work. Um, that and Amnesty International are the two that I probably like as far as voting with my dollars uh, are those two. Um, and like personally, like my like end goal in my startup career, uh, I would like to start like a minority or underrepresented founders focused uh, seed stage fund. Cool. If you had one day left to live, would you rather spend it with Morgan Freeman or Denzel Washington? Oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> I prepare for that question. <laughs> it says a lot uh, about a person. Denzel. Okay. Going out. Guns blazing. <laughs> um, what is the number one country you would recommend everyone should travel, travel to once in their life? Um, so... My mother came here for college um, from Japan um, back in the late 70s, and all her family is still in Japan, so like my grandma and uncle. So pretty much every single summer of my life we spent in Japan, um, and I think that was, you know, had a, such a huge impact uh, on me uh, and my sisters, and um, I think it's such a different culture, too, from the U.S. I, I, I think mm -hmm. it's it's pretty eye-opening for people that visit there and I, I would recommend that cool nice yeah be beautiful country all right that's it you made it you survived amy you're up my all right let's do it <laughs> <laughs> all right um amy uh explain the problems that you're solving at first hand as if i were a five-year-old oh okay that's good because I have a six-year-old, so oh, I will try to calibrate. <laughs> um, we work with um, a health plan insurer client um, who provides Medicaid services to individuals in different states. Uh, this would also presuppose that this five-year-old knows about insurers and Medicaid. Um, <laughs> um, uh, but we, uh, we work with those individuals to help them get access to um, different health benefits that they might be eligible for to different providers. We help them get connected to uh, different doctors that can help them. Um, and really just to help them gain access to benefits that they might be eligible for too. So if they could uh, take advantage of different services in their community, uh, really with the end goal being helping those individuals um, lead the lives that they want to live. So helping them get better uh, health care and also, um, you know, mental health care as well. Cool. That's really cool. Yeah, for for the five-year-olds out there listening, you know, get your <laughs> shit together and get a good insurance plan. Learn about, yeah. <laughs> I have, my, uh, I have my parents visiting right now uh, from New Hampshire, and they both retired last year. And watching them navigate that whole process, mm. like getting insurance uh, as reti recently retired, yeah. um, was like, I'm glad people are bringing tech to it. So intense. <laughs> it's a nightmare. Yeah. yeah. Um, cool. So who are your who are your customers? 
so we have a large health plan as our customer right now. Um, and so we work with them in several different states. So uh, presently we're working with them in Ohio, Tennessee, and Florida. Cool. What is your favorite aspect of working at First Hand? You know, it's obviously like you can probably not be surprised by this, but uh, it's really mission focused. So the team that we've recruited to uh, support the individuals that we work with are uh, many of them have lived experience with uh, serious mental illness or, um, you know, may have experienced homelessness in their lives. So this is deeply personal to so many of our frontline team members who are doing the really hard work every single day. Um, and I think like, you know, it's just a really special place. Like if you talk to anybody who's here, um, it's really because we want to help the people that we're serving um, have better lives. And so I think, you know, getting to be a part of that, uh, getting to, you know, hear about their success stories and, and even like, you know, the, the bad days, like it's just such a privilege. Um, and that's by, by far my favorite thing about being here. That's awesome. Uh, what is an aspect of your culture that you fear losing with growth? Oh, that's a good one. You know, um, there's just like something really special about what we have today. I think, you know, so many of our team members have come in with this lived experience and, um, you know, bring that to their work every day. I think, um, I think like, you know, knowing our, our CEO and our other leaders and the people that we've hired to lead in the teams, you know, I'm not worried about, I guess, maintaining that, but you know, the bigger that you get, like sometimes the further away from that, the center of your mission, you can feel. And like right now we're about 200 people. When we're a thousand people, will people still feel like they can pick up the phone and call me or call our CEO Sommer? You know, there's that, that I don't want to lose. Um, even though that just gets really hard, like the bigger that you get. Yeah. Yeah, that's a whole topic in itself. Um, what is uh, what is your favorite cereal? Hmm. I'm not a huge like cold cereal person, so I do a lot of oatmeal. So I'll oh. count that. I do actually do cold oats um, pretty regularly. So uh, we'll make them like a day or so in advance and enjoy enjoy those. Although I also sometimes heat them up, which my husband mm -hmm. is very confused by. <laughs> so, um, but they're very good that way. What kind of oatmeal? Like what's like, do you have a good, do you have like a, a flavored oatmeal that you go to? Just the plain Quaker oats. Okay. Yeah. Nothing super exciting. What, uh, um, uh, what is your favorite state that you've ever traveled to? Oh, mm, my favorite state. It might be California. Um, we have some family there. And yeah, it's just like, I like that you have all of the diversity of um, the beach, mountains, lots of other types of lands in between. Mm -hmm. Although I grew up in North Carolina and it was the same. Um, but I don't know. California just has like a cool vibe. But. Yeah. North Carolina, also a great state too, though. Yes, um, also also very good. What, uh, oh, do you have a celebrity doppelganger? I don't think so. I don't, okay. not that I know. Do you have any phobias or irrational fears? Hmm, <laughs> let's see. I, this is maybe like New York specific. Um, I really hate the pigeons. Um, the rats, like, you know, I don't, they, uh, they could, they're like, I see them rarely enough that it's such a shock when you do. You're kind of like, oh, yeah, like, I forgot you were here too. Um, but the pigeons, like, they just, like, they don't move. Like, when you're coming down the street and, like, they'll fly at you. Um, I really don't like them. It's because the rats have already moved into apartments. Like they're yeah, living, exactly. they're living there really are... cush lives somewhere. <laughs> close close <laughs> contacts. <laughs> um, d if you had any superpower, what would it be? If you could have any superpower, what would it be? Uh, you know, my son just asked me that last night. So I have an answer for that hmm. readily available. Um, I think that it would be becoming invisible quickly. Uh, I think that would be handy uh, and just being able to, you know, kind of like turn that on or turn it off. Just disappear. Yeah. That's, mm -hmm. a, great, that's a great answer. Um, 
favorite uh, favorite Disney character? Hmm. That's hard. Um, I think, you know, some of like the uh, peripheral characters in The Little Mermaid, like I loved Sebastian. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I think like that he might be one of my favorites. That's great. Yeah, Little Mermaid's incredible. Um, Good answer. All right, that wraps it up. I mean... You, you also nailed it. You, you both passed <laughs> flying colors. Um, so that's a wrap. Yeah. Uh, we went a little bit over, but I think it was, uh, just because the conversation was flowing and, uh, it was a good discussion. So I just wanted to thank you all both again for, for being great guests and, and tac- tackling a topic that is, uh, so vital, uh, to, you know, uh, any company's growth. Um, and obviously extremely important for startups, but thanks. Thanks both for hanging out with us uh, on the hatchpad. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us here.